I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. <clears throat> Here we go. Just want to. We're just. We don't have anything funny or fun, right? There's not like a funny bit of music or something. You know, David. Uh, a week or two ago, can't remember which episode you made fun of the U.S. government for rebranding natural gas exports as "quote unquote" molecules of freedom. Yes. But David, what you don't realize is that in 1953, U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower uh, announced the the formation of Atoms for Peace, a program aimed at encouraging the development of nuclear technology around the world. So (laughs) So what are you saying, Daniel, that uh, the U.S. government has always deserved to have uh, be made fun of? No, David, what I'm saying is that these puns, uh, these, these play on words, if you will, form a long, proud tradition of uh, energy policy and perspective in the U.S. government, which is no laughing matter. (laughs) I don't don't even know how to respond to that. (laughs) Well, speaking of uh, laughing matters, you know, David, we humans, we sit here in our fancy chairs and, and we click clack on our fancy computers and we like to think of ourselves as being technologically advanced and you know all this research and money and time that we have spent to develop nuclear technology our atoms for peace this is an example of our high intellect and creative capabilities would you agree i'm not exactly sure where you're leading me daniel but it seems like a setup of uh human epic levels of hubris no no just we're, we are advanced, right? We invent technologies, right? Sure, yeah, we, we invent stuff. Ah, well, David, you're uh, revealing your ignorance once again. Oh, no. Because <laughs> what if I told you that we humans were not even the first to invent a nuclear reactor? Who was the first, you might ask? Well, it was none other than the Earth herself. That's right, David. Just under two billion years ago, you know, hop in a skip back into our historical past, a few nuclear reactors started up beneath the Earth's crust on the western coast of Africa in modern day Gabon. And these reactors generated power for a few hundred thousand years. When you say generate power, what what type of power you're are you talking about here? I know you're not saying that this is like producing 110 volt power or 220 or anything. Uh, you're talking like heat, right? Right. I mean, we humans have simply uh, applied nuclear power to the generation of electricity, but the Earth had no goals of such uh, simple ambitions. It simply generated nuclear power because it could. And you're sure this is not like an ancient alien scenario where two billion years ago we were visited by our alien overlords who built these reactors as a gift for future humanity to discover to unlock the secrets of the atom. I mean, if that were the case, the aliens were uh, quite a few years ahead because I don't think we even existed at that time, David. So You don't think so? You don't think we were two billion years ago? <laughs> Way to stick to conventional ideas of archaeology and the civilization that, that the man wants you to think is true, Daniel. I expect it better. Well, let's get back to the more important question, which is how did the Earth do this? Um, And as we'll talk about, you know, uranium occurs naturally all throughout the world. And in this particular region, there was a high concentration of uranium, which then became inundated with groundwater. And that groundwater acted as a moderator for slowing down the speed of isolated neutron particles, something we might expand on. And this slower speed of these neutrons allowed them to interact with nearby uranium-235 isotopes, causing them to become unstable and then undergo fission, which is basically just a, a atomic explosion on the atom scale, of course. And Some might say the atomic scale. <laughs> some might say that, David, but not me. Um, so this, these tiny explosions interacted 
uh, released more neutrons, which then interacted with other nearby uranium-235 atoms, causing a chain reaction that persisted for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, you might also be asking, why could this not occur today? Well, at the time, two billion years ago, uranium-235 occurred in nature at higher concentrations. Specifically, around 3% of all natural uranium was the 235 isotope. And that is actually the ideal percentage to reach critical mass of this isotope when it's inundated in a neutron moderator like water. And it's why when we enrich uranium today, we actually have to bring up the concentration of uranium-235 from about 0.7%, which is its current natural makeup because of the, the fact that it's half-lived away, so to speak, over the past 2 billion years. And we actually bring it up to 3 to 5% concentration in the enriched uranium we use as fuel for our thermal nuclear power reactors. Uh, another fact that made this natural reactor possible was the fact that ambient levels of oxygen in the atmosphere were much higher back then. And that increases the solubility of uranium in water, which likely led to greater concentrations of it in this region. I'm actually sort of aware of this uh, natural reactor, Daniel. I was playing dumb here. And I think one of my favorite parts... That's because you always read my notes, David. <laughs> one of my favorite parts of this is uh, the fact that it was naturally able to, to regulate itself. So like, what prevents this from becoming a runaway reaction besides the fact that the uranium percentages of 235 was you know, not 20% like we typically need on a nuclear weapon, but eventually it could build up to that with the generation of isotopes and whatever. But what was interesting was as this groundwater sets in and and uh begins regulating this neutron reaction that causes the the larger nuclear fission to happen daniel eventually it starts heating up right because it's generating all this excess energy which is why and how we run our nuclear reactors today to generate electrical power via uh, steam loops and, and turning generators well as this heated up it would eventually boil up all the naturally occurring groundwater here it would turn to steam it would empty out and then the reaction would stop because you didn't have the regulator there anymore and then as it cooled down, the water would trickle back in and the reaction would restart once more. So it was a naturally occurring, naturally regulating process, which is really interesting. No meltdowns. Yeah. So I guess nuclear power is really safe. In fact, no humans died as a result Amazing. of this nuclear reactor. Close the book. End of the episode. Well, you know, you, you talk about it being self-regulating, but what about the waste, David? This is one of the major concerns we have with the man-made nuclear reactors of today. And it turns out that this site is a useful case study for people trying to research the potential for underground storage of our nuclear waste because the radioactive material left over from this natural process are still safely tucked away in the ground right where they were produced and haven't really moved at all in the past two billion years when they were formed. Meaning, Perhaps we will find a way to store our own radioactive nuclear waste in similar pockets underneath the Earth's crust, where they can decay well out of harm's way. That's such an interesting story, Daniel. And uh, this whole episode is really interesting. I really, this has been one of the most fun things to research and read about. And I mean, I love nuclear power. I think it's incredibly interesting. Um, I, I have mixed emotions on the application of that. And we'll talk about that through the course of this episode. But I mean, it's just been fun reading about this uh, this technology. It's really incredible. It's amazing how we've harnessed this fundamental force of the universe. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about more of just the very basic, what is nuclear power? What is nuclear fission? What is fusion? And all all that stuff in, in just a moment. I know we threw out a lot of 235s and stuff to immediately get started. But I mean, just for a second, let's marvel at this. Uh, in a way, I guess that was sort of happening back in the 1950s when we were in the atomic age, when everybody was talking about nuclear power as this atoms for peace story you were just discussing there, Daniel. And the idea that we would be liberated and the world would be drastically improved through the application of this nuclear technology in every single little component of our life. And people came up with some crazy ideas. Have you, have you seen some of these, Daniel? Crazy ideas for nuclear reactors. You mean like nuclear-powered cars yeah. and nuclear-powered cell phones, David? Well, I don't know about nuclear-powered cell phones, but I mean, we've always had an interest in radiation and novel applications of that. I mean, you've seen those photos maybe of in the past when we had first discovered radium and, and other technologies and other minerals that would glow in the dark. People just like 
casually painting them onto watch faces. And of course, they would all get cancer later, um, as well as the people who carry the watches around. Um, the same thing happened with x-rays. You'd like go to the shoe store and they'd have like an x-ray machine there and you would just like stand on it and it would x-ray like straight up through your feet. Um, of course, into your genitals uh, and, and give you like a... Yeah, we don't need to use a uh, yardstick to measure your feet. Let's just... Uh... Yeah, just x-ray. Let's see how your foot is actually fitting in, in a shoe. Um, not to get, you know, not that that's exactly radiation um, in the same sense that we're talking about here. But I mean, the whole thing is interesting and just the ways that we discover this novel technology, we eventually realize is it's killing us. But in the meantime, we have a lot of fun with it. And that, that's really what the 50s and the 60s were. People were designing cars. They were plans for commercial airplanes that were powered by nukes. Ships, uh, like home nuke units. Uh, the Soviet Union especially was really excited about this. And they built nuclear plants all over the place. And they built a lot of novel test nuke items that, that the U.S. only planned but never actually constructed. Well, Russia did. They have still to this day, you know, nuclear icebreakers, a lot of nuclear ships outside of the military. Um, the U.S. Is, is basically limited to only the submarines and uh, aircraft carriers that are nuclear vessels. But there were a lot of uh, experimental nuclear ships in Russia, nuclear lighthouses, uh, nuclear places just all over it. And it made sense, especially in Russia, because much of Russia is isolated and out in the middle of nowhere. And so trying to maintain supply chains of bringing out coal or oil or other forms of energy to these areas in order to generate power is difficult to impossible. But if you could just load up a nuclear plant there and it'd be set for five or 20 or 60 years, then that was awesome because you could have this power in, in places that were far off and not have to worry about the logistics of maintaining that power going on all the time. And then you could build up towns and, and civilizations there. So it was really seen as like, we're going to change the world. This is opening up new frontiers in a way that we haven't had ever a chance before in our lives. And we're going to really radically make the world a better place. And then things got a little more realistic once this honeymoon period passed. And we realized, you know what, actually nuclear technology is hard. It's expensive and there's a lot of drawbacks, even if there are a lot of positives at the same time. And we're going to go over all this over the course of this show. Nuclear is obviously a very, uh, how would you, you say it, Daniel? It's a hot topic issue. Um, people get very heated on one side or the other. A lot of controversy. Yeah, both pro and against. Well, you know, people might be asking, why are we doing a show on nuclear power? Because there are a lot of podcasts. There are a lot of articles on the subject. Um, so let me just get this out of the way for any of you who want to listen to another podcast on nuclear power. Uh, let me just sum it up for you. Nuclear power is controversial. There was the Three Mile Island accident in, the, in 1979, the Chernobyl accident, and of course, the 2011 Fukushima accident. This caused a lot of public outcry. Are there risks to nuclear power? Well, there certainly is radiation. Is radiation dangerous? Well, it can be. But you know, we can't look at the past because that was old technology. Now people are inventing new technology. So I guess we'll see. <laughs> and close out. Yeah. Have you ever heard one of those before, David? Yeah. Like literally every single podcast, every news report, every uh, documentary, every every little video on YouTube, they're all the same thing, like made for, for different nuclear power companies or environmental groups, whatever. It's, it, it's really interesting just like how unified and... Um, sanitize these stories that are put out all the time. And and I mean, I came into this this episode not sure where I stood on nuclear power. I don't know if you did either, Daniel. And I mean, I'm still at this point, there are pros and cons. I'm going to go through this over the course of this episode, but we really tried to approach this as um, neutrally as possible, which is weird that I'm concerned about this more on this uh, nuclear power episode than some of these other <laughs> controversial topics that we've addressed but it really there's so much animosity on both sides like we're going to be called shills for for big oil we're going to be called shills for big nuke because everyone picks and chooses what they want but i um, mean it, it's a loaded thing uh recently a gallup poll in 2016 found for the first time more americans are against nuclear power than for it um i ran some informal polls um just of, of my immediate friend group on instagram on twitter and I had, I don't know, about 40 or 50 people reply, and about 80% were pro-nuclear power, 20% against it, which was much higher than I was expecting. I was sort of surprised. I don't know if you asked anybody, Daniel. Well, a lot of people I talked to just kind of um, said, hey, I don't really know. You know. I don't know enough about the technology. There's a lot of risk, but I trust the various regulatory bodies that we trust these types of things too. Well, maybe that's a good way to intro just a very basic overview of some of this technology when we start talking about, you know, what is nuclear power? 
Uh, and then from there, discuss maybe some of these reactors and, and explore further into this subject. Uh, well, let me explain to you, David, uh, just the basic process here. So you have protons and you have neutrons, right? And electrons. Okay. Well, we're not talking about electrons. I, I got all these other things. I got quarks. I got uh, neutrinos, Higgs boson. Well, you mentioned being a little bit neutral for the show, but you know what's not neutral is the electrical charge of a proton. Right, David? Wow. And all protons have an electrical charge. And it's the same electrical charge. Mm -hmm. but what happens when you bring two things together, David, with the same electrical charge? Do you mean like, like two positive things? Yeah. I guess they repel each other? That's right. So then we had the question, how does an atom keep its nucleus together? Do you mean because it has all these positively charged things that are held together along with all these, these things that carry no charge, but they should be pushing each other apart? Yes, exactly. Well, David, I'm glad you asked because the answer is the nuclear force, also known as the strong force, which is a fundamental force of the universe, much like electromagnetism and gravity itself. And what's interesting is that the nuclear force is maximally attractive at about one fermimeter, which is one quadrillionth of a meter. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. And, and it just so happens when you know two protons are one fermimeter away from each other, the force of attraction with the nuclear force is more powerful than their electrical charge is repulsive. So they're trying to get away from each other, but that nuclear force is bringing them together. But then I know what you're asking, David. Well, if the nuclear force applies in this way, and it does apply to basically anything that comes within one fermimeter of itself or, or of something else, why in the process of just particles flying around through our universe and coming into a contact with each other, why is everything just not being accumulated into a giant ball <laughs> called, held together by the nuclear force. <laughs> okay. oh, yeah, Daniel, why? I, that is exactly what I'm thinking. So tell me, why is there not just a giant ball of matter of everything? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you. Unlike the electromagnetic force, which is infinite in distance, right? Theoretically, two particles can repulse each other you know, a million years, uh, a million miles away from each other. It's just that that force becomes exponentially weaker the further away they get from each other. The nuclear force is not like that. The nuclear force actually has a range. In fact, if you were to bring two particles together of a distance of 0.7 fermimeters, the nuclear force actually flips and starts repelling them. And then if they get 2.5 fermimeters away from each other, that nuclear force no longer has any attraction. And so what happens is that as these particles come together, the nucleus of the atom gets bigger and bigger, and it starts to reach the outer limits of that nuclear force, meaning that the ability for the nuclear force to hold them together is being outpaced by their desire to push themselves apart. Mm. And that, David, is why we cannot have an atom that is over 100 protons, because it becomes so unstable that they just push each other apart. Well, I guess to be fair, you can have those those atoms, but they almost instantly decay into something else. That's true. Because we do have things on the periodic table above 100, 115, I think. A lot of those are man-made though, and we create them in like huge particle accelerators and like you said they literally exist for like half a second and then they dissipate. Half a second would be huge. A uh, nanosecond. <laughs> a firmus second. I don't know. For a firmus second. One quadrillionth of a second and they're gone. What are we up to? We're up to 118 on the periodic table from this periodic table I just pulled up. And, and if anybody has heard about nuclear power, you know that one of the most common fuel types is uranium. And it just so happens that uranium has 92 protons, making it on the upper end of that 100 proton limit. And in fact, uranium is quite unstable as a result. So it's a big, heavy atom is what you're saying. Yes. And it's already at the limit of saying, don't put anything else on me or else, you know, I'm getting close to blow. Which is why all it takes is a single neutron traveling at high speeds, but not too high, to hit the center of that atom and you get fission. Unstable, the nuclear force cannot contain it. The atom splits, releasing energy in addition to another neutron, which can then go and hit another atom and you get a chain reaction and so forth. So what is fission? I mean, I hear that word a lot, Daniel. So I'm playing dumb cop here. Tell me what fission is. Fission is just that. It's, it's the splitting atom, one nucleus into two separate nucleuses, right? Mm -hmm. But what do we get out of that? If we're just breaking atoms apart, doesn't it just leave us with two smaller atoms? 
So remember how I said protons want to repel each other? Mm-hmm. Well, that, that desire to repel each other is potential energy, right? Remember from your physics uh, 101 classes, you know, a cart sitting at the very top of a roller coaster represents potential energy because it is about to release a whole bunch of kinetic energy. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what these atoms want to do. They really want to explode, releasing a whole bunch of energy and heat. As an aside, that potential energy thing is stuck in my head for forever. And every time I walk up any set of stairs, all I can think is, <laughs> man, I sure am acquiring a lot of potential energy right now. I hope nobody pushes me off and uh, converts that to kinetic energy. Yeah, that's it's literally plays in my head every time I walk upstairs. My brain is broken. So now your brain is Funny. broken, listeners. You're going to be stuck with this too. Yeah, so every atom is progressively walking upstairs. And when we hit it with a neutron, it falls over and releases that potential energy as kinetic energy, which we can then harness by heating things like water, generating steam, which can then turn a turbine, which generates electrical energy, and so forth. Um, but one little tidbit I want to just mention here, we talked about that natural nuclear reactor and how being inundated with groundwater allowed chain reactions to take place. And that's because for uranium-235, the most common isotope that we talk about in terms of nuclear fuel, a single neutron traveling at its fast pace very often when it comes into contact with a uranium-235 atom, will simply be traveling so fast that it passes right through it and causes no fission. And that's why we introduce what are known as neutron moderators. And very often this is just water, where we inundate nuclear reactors in our thermal nuclear power reactors in water because that acts to slow down the speed of those isolated neutrons so that they have a higher chance when they come into contact with the uranium-235 atom of being absorbed, disrupting that strong force and causing fission. Exactly. And there are a number of moderators that we use besides water. Uh, liquid sodium is a popular one. And to be fair, there are also other types of nuclear plants that do not use this uh, moderation technique. They're called fast reactors, and we'll briefly mention them later. Um, but this is the way that most reactors that are in service right now around the world are constructed. So the other really important thing to take away here is, as Daniel talks about when we're releasing this potential energy, is that it's a lot of energy. And while on the scale of a single atom, it might not be that much, when you scale it out in these chain reactions and you start talking about large amounts of atom, like you might find in a kilogram or several kilograms of product, we are talking limitless, essentially, amounts of energy. And in fact, it's about, just to put this in perspective, say you had a kilogram of coal or a kilogram of uh, a fissionable product that you were performing fission on, like say uranium-235, you would be able to release two and a half million times more energy from fission than from burning that coal product. It's a lot of energy. And this is why we had the development of nuclear weapons, which could allow these uh, chain reactions to occur in a runaway state by using higher uh, concentrations of these products. Um, so like uranium-235, instead of three to 5%, you'd see it at something like 20 to 30%. Mm-hmm which allows these neutron reactions to occur much faster and, and detonate like you see. And, and we all know the power of a nuclear explosion. So these are just really tiny nuclear chain reactions, um, but done in, in a way that it's slow enough, it's controlled, and we can utilize it for generating power or something. Sort of the same way, I guess, that early vaccines were a weak version of a viral infection. Um, it would give us time to maintain it and build up whatever we need from it versus just like giving somebody smallpox and seeing what happened. Um, it's, it's, I mean, not exactly, but it's a good way to think yeah. about it for the larger conversation of what is the difference between nuclear power, fission power, and a nuclear detonation. Well, that's why, you know, one of the main concerns with nuclear power development is the way it's so easy to contribute to nuclear proliferation of weapons around the world, because the process of enriching uranium from its natural 0.7% concentration of the isotope we need to 5%, well, you could quite easily in this process just go ahead and enrich it to 20%, like you mentioned, and siphon some of that off for the use of weapons. And so that's why we see controversy over things like Iran's nuclear industry, where you know they want to develop the technology for electrical power generation, but other countries are saying, well, hold up, if you can do that, then that means you can also produce weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. And the other side is that some reactor plants will also generate this uh, material that can be used for nuclear weapons. And again, we'll, we'll go into that. But um, 
And we've we've sort of vastly simplified some of this basic uh, explanation. There's different types of nuclear forces, strong versus weak. But for the functions of this show, I think what we said is accurate and clear and helpful. And so maybe now that we sort of understand what nuclear fission is, and throughout the course of this episode, when we're talking about nuclear generation of power, we're discussing specifically nuclear fission, which is the separation of these atoms, like Daniel's talking about, to release that potential energy versus nuclear fusion, which I'll briefly mention, and I will be sure to mention that we're talking about fusion, not fission, which is the process of combining atoms, small atoms into bigger ones, and releasing energy in that process. This is the same thing that the sun does. Um, But it's a different technology, even though it is exploiting these nuclear forces just in a different way. That is not what we're talking about. Nuclear, when we say nuclear power, it's nuclear fission. So maybe we should talk about the types of reactors that we have all around the world that are generating much of our world's power. Yeah, let's briefly talk about the different types of reactors, because one thing that is fascinating to me and to other people I've talked to about this is that at the end of the day, what so much of our energy generation comes down to is different ways of heating up water into steam and turning a turbine. (laughs) And even our most advanced nuclear power plants essentially just do this, right? And the most popular form of nuclear reactor we have falls into the category of thermal nuclear reactors, which to simplify is just the use of a neutron moderator like the one we talked about. And under this category, we have pressurized water reactors and we have boiling water reactors. And these essentially do the same thing, but in a pressurized water reactor, our core is surrounded by uh, water that is kept pressurized so that it cannot turn into a gas. Uh, This water is heated by this nuclear energy generation. That pressurized water, which is now superheated, gets pumped into a steam generator, a separate compartment where water is sitting. The pressurized water heats up this other water, which then turns into steam. That steam is redirected to a room with a turbine. That steam turns that turbine, and then that generates electricity. And then, of course, these water sources just get cycled back through the process. And a boiling water reactor is basically the same thing, except the water that immediately surrounds the reactor core is allowed to turn immediately into steam, which then turns the turbine. And then that steam is then cooled. And in fact, you know those huge uh, cooling towers that you see like uh, from The Simpsons where all this steam is coming out? That's actually just where this superheated water goes. They drop it from the top to the bottom so that it can cool by the surrounding air releasing all that steam that you see going into the atmosphere. And then in that cooled state, it gets recycled back into the nuclear reactor core. But those are just the basic reactors. David, why don't you fill us in on some of the more interesting reactors out there and and, and maybe even some of the ones that we haven't seen yet? Well, I don't want to drag this out too long because there are so many different types of reactors and they get like really nitty gritty and the differences between them. Uh, they, they have different moderators or they have slightly different cooling or, or, or loops. So I'm just going to really focus on the big ones. So the most common type of reactor here is, of course, the pressurized water reactor utilizing light water, which is just basically regular water. These plants are very common. They're fairly easy to build because there's a lot of time and money that's been put researching them, in large part because this is what the Navy wanted when they were designing reactors for their submarines and for their aircraft carriers. And the reason why is because when you're in the ocean, you have a large amount of just regular water readily available for you to cool your your reactor. And so they realized, hey, you know, like if we could figure out a way to build a nuke reactor that is just utilizing this regular old water, then uh, we can very easily have these submarines and, and craft that can travel all around the world at enormous amounts of distance without having to refuel um, and only have to worry about, you know, eventually coming up for food or to exchange other uh, necessities that the sailors on board might need. So we poured billions and billions of dollars in this technology, figured out how to make it small, uh, fairly reliable. And because of that, it is the most common type of reactor around the world. And and you'll find as you go through this nuclear story that a lot of the decisions that, that are made in terms of the civilian nuclear area when you're generating power are just side effects of somebody trying to figure out, well, how can we use this technology for the military? And now that we have this military funding and research, like maybe we can spin some of this off for the civilian sector. Um, And there's a a lot of it with the uh, material that's used, the choices to use certain types of uranium 
uh, because they're byproducts of the refining process of the materials being used to create nuclear bombs. All these things are because much of the, the nuclear landscape today is because of this military consideration. We want to build bombs and we need nuke reactors for our submarines and carriers. Therefore, we're going to create this type of reactor. And that means that research in a lot of these other reactors I'm about to go into have lagged and are now only starting to finally catch up, even though many of them are much more appropriate for civilian use than what we see today. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so most of our stuff is light water, pressurized water reactors. Um, there are some reactors, especially in Canada, that are utilizing something called heavy water, which is interesting. It's 2H2O, which is two hydrogens per two oxygens. That's too much H2O. Or alternatively, D2O. D is uh, deuterium, which is a hydrogen isotope. And uh, this just means that instead of having the regular H2O model molecule, you have this extra thing there that makes it a little bit heavier. And it is a better neutron uh, moderator in this process. Heavy water is naturally occurring. Something like one in 4,000 or 3,000 molecules of regular water has one of these special heavy water things. So you can extract it from large amounts of, of regular water, say by spinning it out uh, via centrifuge. Of course, you have to have very sterilized water before you can even do that. And when we were building nuclear plants and nuclear bombs for the first time, uh, you were seeing the construction of all these heavy water plants. And uh, during World War II, there was a lot of, of intrigue and, and night raids blowing up different countries' heavy water plants to prevent them from being able to build nuclear weapons at the time because they thought this was one of the only ways in order to construct these uh, nuclear materials at the time that we figured out more since then. To this day, still, um, Iran, if we're bringing that up, has constructed heavy water plants that are heavily sanctioned. They're limited in how much they're allowed to export or create every year. This is one of the choke points in designing and maintaining and reaching nuclear power. Now, even if you're not building uh, heavy water plants, it still is important for some of the processes to get there. The other, of course, being centrifuges, which is used to refine uranium from that 0.7% uh, naturally occurring 235 that you mentioned, Daniel, up to the five or so percent that you need in order to maintain a uh, fissionable material. And you do that by just spinning it. And, you know, this one weighs more so it moves out to the side. And there's a lot of new uh, research going into these types of plants. Uh, there's a new one called the European Pressurized Reactor that's that's very exciting. The first one just went online in China. They're building a couple in Europe right now. These are generation three plus type reactors. They should be safer. They should be more efficient because the big problem with light water reactors is that they're not very efficient. The first ones were producing energy of only 1% to 3% of the total energy that we put into it with this uranium. But later ones are getting into higher efficiency gains, as high as 30 40% on the paper plans. We need less nuclear material for them. We're able to generate more power or we can just build smaller plants in order to generate the same amount of electricity, all of which is good. But these new plans are plagued with problems. They've been slow. They're way over budget. And that seems to be a continuing story when we're talking about the design of new nuclear types of reactors. Um, I mentioned that these were Generation 3 plus reactors. So we sort of see reactors broken down. Gen 1, which were the first research stuff. Gen 2s, which were the very early reactor boom, um, where people started building these commercially for the first time. And what comprises most of the reactors around the world today? Mm -hmm. And most of these reactors were built for a 60 to 75 year lifespan, a lifespan that some of them are starting to run up towards. They're seeing their licenses either extended or decommissioning plans are starting to proceed forward for them. These reactors tend to be more unsafe. They tend to be much less power efficient and they tend to be more expensive to run, though they were cheaper to build than more modern plans. Um, we are now currently at Gen 3 slash Gen 3 plus type reactors. I don't know if there's many Gen 3 pluses even running at the moment, but the things that are being built lately are these Gen 3s, which are safer, they're more efficient, they need less material, uh, they're more resistant to nuclear proliferation, that is creating material that can be used to create nuclear weapons. Um, and the future is Gen 4 plans, which are either radically different or uh, much safer. We won't start seeing these until probably 2030 at the earliest. And these, uh, many of the designs are supposed to be basically meltdown proof supposed to be basically impossible to create proliferation material from this. And if we're going to continue pushing the nuclear path, this is where the future lies. And many of these designs are some of these alternative type reactors, which I'm about to go into. So one of the terms you might have heard before when we're talking about nuclear power, and one that always comes up a lot when people, especially nuclear advocates, are talking about some of the problems that nuclear faces, is something called a breeder reactor or a fast reactor. 
And this is a very different type of design for constructing a nuclear reactor in the case that we mentioned those neutron moderators were needed in traditional reactor types. Breeders and fast reactors forego that. And it means that it's burning this fuel in a very different way than a traditional reactor. And so that means you utilize different fuel in different percentages than what you traditionally would. And you also get different types of waste coming out of this process, some of which can be reused in other plants in order basically to start generating fuel from the plants that are generating energy anyway. And you can create this closed loop where you don't even need to mine new fuel in order to power the plants you already have because nuclear reactors do need to be refueled uh, every couple of years. It's not just something you build it and it runs for forever. There's upkeep. They have to mine new stuff, refine it, and put it in the plant to maintain it and keep it working. There weren't many breeder reactors in existence. France had one or two in their history. They've been shut down. Though the Russians have designed a couple of new types of breeder reactors, of fast reactors, that they are uh, testing right now and will enter into the market commercially very soon. They're very exciting in the way that they offer this chance for us to utilize some of the weapons that we're trying to decommission in a way that doesn't mean we have to just store it randomly, but instead can turn it into something useful, in this case, electrical power. Yeah, fast breeder reactors are interesting. Number one, because it eliminates that neutron moderator that we've talked about, which allows you to have smaller, more efficient reactors. Um, and like you're talking about, it enables you to use a lot more diverse sources of fuel, including the waste that's left behind for, from more traditional forms of nuclear power generation. And again, going back to the purpose of this neutron moderator, neutrons travel so fast, you have to slow them down to increase the chance that they will interact with the uranium-235. So in fast breeder reactors, if you want to have a chain reaction without this neutron moderator, you have to increase the concentration of uranium-235 so that when uh, a fast neutron that's not slowed down does interact with the atom, there are more surrounding atoms for this fission to interact with causing a chain reaction. Now, this is expensive, and one of the reasons why uh, it has been prohibitive for us to implement fast breeder reactors is because the fuel is more expensive to enrich, but also they're more expensive to design and to operate these reactors. But once you get it running, like you're talking about, David, the waste that's generated can then be reused as additional fuel, which dramatically cuts down the amount of time that we have radioactive waste in our environment from thousands to millions of years to just maybe a couple hundred. Yeah, and that cost of fuel, that economics of producing the fuel that these stations actually need in order to produce energy is one of the major components of this larger story of why we have nuclear power the way we do. Once again, we already had these refining capabilities for creating nuclear weapons. So if we can design plants that utilize the same sort of material to set lower percentages, then we should build those. And um, when we're utilizing different types of fuel, that means that there needs to be new investment in the tune of billions, tens of billions of dollars in order to refine that fuel in a way. It just never made these plants economically viable, which is why we haven't seen them constructed. In the same way that heavy water plants tend to be safer and they tend to be more efficient in utilizing the fuel that they put into, um, which is why Canada built them, but they built them on the presumption that uranium will cost more than it actually does. But costs of uranium mean that we didn't ever need to build more efficient plants to utilize this fuel in a better way. And we could just say, fuck it, you know, let's, let's just burn what we have. It's easy. It's cheap. It's not a problem. But the one thing that we always hear, or I always hear when I'm talking about nuclear power now, especially with people who are just really gung-ho and excited about this technology, is something called molten salt reactors or liquid fuel thorium reactors. David, these reactors are much, much different. Yeah, it's a totally radically different design. I saw a YouTube video. Um, they don't even use uranium. Yeah. I saw a YouTube video on this. Uh, some guy was explaining how the reactors they were designing are the future. Mm -hmm. And so typically, you know, in the reactors we use today, we mine this uranium, we enrich it, and then we manufacture it into these long rods, which we then insert right. into the nuclear reactor. And then, of course, we have control rods, and the control rods uh, absorb neutrons, so you can actually kind of control the speed at which a chain reaction occurs by just inserting the control rods or lifting them up once these uh, uranium rods are doing their thing. But a thorium nuclear reactor, David, doesn't use any of that nonsense, okay? They take liquid thorium. And to be clear, liquid thorium, thorium's a metal. 
<laughs> and so liquid thorium is it really hot melted metal. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's really hot. And then they encase it in a ceramic ball about the size of a uh, pool ball, you know, like a billiards ball that you use when you play, play pool at the pool hall. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. So uh, that's nothing like a rod. That's totally different. <laughs> it's, it's, it's rods, not balls. Well, I mean, that is a very specific type of one of these designs. And there's a lot of different thorium-based reactor designs. The ball thing is, is a little bit new to me. Typically, I've seen them designed in a single loop system um, or a, a two-fluid system. But um, that sort of reminds me of pebble bed type reactors, which I'm not going to talk about today. But thorium is exciting for a number of reasons. And they're not all ball related. Thorium is a, another radioactive element, but it is one that is uh, widely available. There's much more thorium available than uranium or plutonium, the other elements that can easily be turned into nuclear fuel. And what's more important is thorium reactors have much less waste than a traditional uranium based reactor. And it can run in a much safer way, like you mentioned, though there are different models for this that are much more difficult to get a meltdown. The plant basically just shuts itself down when you get to a critical stage instead of exploding, like we see in something that's utilizing a pressure system or one of these similar types of reactors. So because of this, it's become a very popular meme in the, in the internet uh, where people are talking about nuclear power. They say, yeah, blah, 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 but the future is thorium or lifter. You've probably seen this LFTR, liquid fuel thorium reactors. And to be fair, there are other types of molten salt reactors so the thorium one gets the most attention because of these advantages of utilizing thorium as a fuel, um, its ability to very easily be found, the better waste products from it, and also the fact that you can't turn it into fissile material in order to build nuclear weapons. So it's very popular for internet tech bros because of this. And they'll go on and they'll send you their favorite YouTube video, like I guess that you watched, Daniel, saying that the future's thorium, you know, check out this stuff. It's so great. It plugs itself. It's got balls. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And... The U.S. did do research on this. They actually built a molten salt reactor at Oak Ridge in Tennessee, which is one of our largest nuclear research facilities. But then we stopped doing research into thorium for decades. And it was relegated sort of to a side project that universities would work on whenever they had spare time or somebody's passion project. It sort of uh, died off. And there's a number of reasons why that's the case. One of them is because, like I mentioned, as Oak Ridge was developing these different nuclear technologies, they wanted things that could be turned into weapons. And because there is no secondary use of the ability to refine this product, to utilize the waste for something uh, useful for the larger military economy, which we discussed last week, which is so important to the way that the United States sees basically everything, research on this was dropped. Um, And that's what at least you'll hear from the lifter fans, especially. The parts they leave out is that while we were able to create these reactors and to work on a small experimental scale, the problem is lifter... And this molten salt style of running a reactor is extremely difficult. The molten fuel is extremely caustic. It runs at an extremely high temperature, something like 700 degrees Celsius. And it also has a problem of making the the material that it's encased with get constantly bombarded by neutrons because of these chain reactions that are occurring, Daniel. And this neutron bombardment, the combination of the high temperatures and the fact that it's extremely caustic mean that there aren't many materials that can contain this stuff. And while it can work for a little bit while you're running experiments on it, in terms of designing a plant that can utilize a closed-loop system for 50, 60, 75 years, material science hasn't figured out anything that can contain this yet. So the problem here is trying to commercialize this product into something that doesn't need to have the loops replaced every five years because they get brittle from the bombardment and crack and then leak liquid fuel everywhere. And of course, this wouldn't be as bad as a traditional meltdown, but you can't have a design that either needs to be basically totally rebuilt every few years in order to keep it from bursting everywhere or just put up with these cracks. Well, I I think this is just uh, something that gets overlooked with most discussions of innovative technologies, which is we can design something that is really interesting and really novel. But once you try to scale that up and you're asking the question, well, where are all these special alloys? Where is all this uh, very rare material, these minerals, these metals that we need to make this technology possible? If we want to scale it up, where are they going to come from? And very often that means going to some region where there's a lot of violence and imposing our political will on the people and somehow extracting that from beneath their feet Mm -hmm. and leaving them in worse shape than they were before. Yeah. 
I mean, that, that's a really good point. And well, first off, we would have to identify what these alloys are in the first place because we haven't figured out materials yet that can be utilized for this in a non experimental way, but playing out to commercial thing. We don't know what it would cost. We don't know where these elements would come from, though they would probably be at least in part rare earth elements, like you mentioned. And those almost entirely come from problematic regions of either human rights violations or are just uh, awful environmentally in the way that we extract and refine them. And and so we at this point, we start sort of decentralizing the violence of creating these things. And we'll talk about the associated deaths with different types of electricity generation in a minute. But this would be a type that would never find its way into a report because it's down the supply chain because it's been decentralized. And that's one of the really great things our economic system does. And that's the decentralization of violence. We centralize everything. We centralize capital. We centralize control over all this stuff. But we decentralize violence and push it as far out of sight as we can. And so it enables all these systems to run in a way that is cost effective, economic. And cost and economics really at the end of the day is the central conversation about nuclear generation. But I think it's a really good point that you bring up here, Daniel. I hope that we put a lot more research into this. We solve these material science problems because if we can figure out the commercialization of a thorium fuel reactor, then nuclear power is going to be a much better place than it is right now. There's a lot of research going on in this at the moment. China's investing a lot in it. They have some experimental reactors that they're constructing and and operating. Uh, There's more that are being designed. India's nuclear program is very heavily dependent upon the idea that when they get to their third tier of this program, they're currently on the first, they will transition entirely over to thorium reactors, in large part because they have almost no uranium reserves, but they do have large thorium reserves and they would like to be energy independent and this would allow them to do so. But again, the technology is not there. China, uh, India, they're estimating like maybe 2030, we could have experimental stuff running at a scale that we could start talking about commercializing this process, but you won't see liquid fuel thorium reactors or thorium-based things um, or these molten salt reactors, which are using traditional materials, but in a molten salt way, which run against the same material science problems up until commercially speaking, 2040 optimistically, 2050, maybe realistically, if ever. And like I said, there's a lot more other types of reactors here. There's a lot of ones that are only experimental and aren't really worth talking about yet because they've never been scaled up in any sort of significant way. There's a lot of reactors that had startups behind them, and uh, you can find a bunch of amazing YouTube videos about how they're going to change the world. And then the companies behind them, turns out the technology didn't work and they went out of business. You can find some technologies that are promising the world, but haven't been able to ever show that they're capable of doing the things that they, that they claim. Uh, Bill Gates is sponsoring a company called TerraPower. That's one of these groups. Um, and they just had a big setback with um, these tariffs that are going on. Um, they were going to build some stuff in cooperation with China. Now they no longer can. And so uh, the future of these production of new reactors seems very much continuing down, just refining these designs we've already had. Many of these reactors designed in the late 80s, early 90s, and finally getting them to construct to today. Because this is just a process that takes a really long time. Sort of like building a advanced military fighter. You start designing it now. That means maybe it'll fly in 30 years. And a lot of these reactors are that way too. So we design it now. In 10 or 20 years, we'll have an experimental one built. And then another 10 to 20 years after that, you'll have the first commercial products being built. So many of the reactors that are being built today as new technologies, Gen 3 Plus as Gen 4, were designed in the late 80s and early 90s. And it's just the fact of the matter that this is something that takes a lot of work, a lot of investment, uh, a lot of research, a lot of trial and error to make sure that we're getting it right and doing so in a safe way. It's not a quick technology. And we can't come in today and say, oh, I've got this great idea. Um, Let me just develop it. That's how you get disasters. Uh, Disasters, Master David. Um, You know, nuclear power has the potential to give us a lot of power. Whoa. And in fact, it already does. In 2017, 10% of all the energy produced worldwide came from nuclear power generation. Uh, And that was just from 450 total reactors around the world, or 449. And we are projected to double this generation soon, as we currently have 54 reactors under construction around the world, with another 480 or so that are either planned or proposed. Last year, in 2018, a whole 19.3% of the power in the United States was generated by nuclear reactors. So that's that's a benefit. 
But there's another benefit, David, that uh, I think you should consider, which is, you know, you, you mentioned disasters and we'll talk about some of the mistakes that have taken place. But uh, some scientists will actually make the claim that nuclear power and our implementation of it has actually saved lives when you compare, uh, you know, the amount of lives lost uh, as a result of nuclear power generation versus those that were lost from the air pollution that comes from our greenhouse gas emitting coal, natural gas, and, and other fossil fuel burning power plants. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to just interrupt you for a second because I know you have some numbers and, and whatever. But yes, this is something that comes up a lot, especially online in nuclear discussions. Um, there is a very large perceived fear of the dangers of nuclear power. And we sort of gloss over the dangers of oil and, and natural gas and, and burning coal, which are in themselves very deadly. And we've, we've talked about this actually a couple times on the show. And, and this is very fair. We, we don't think about these things. Um, air pollution is one of the largest killers of people on Earth, period. And we did a whole show on air pollution, the variety of problems it can cause, not just in terms of eventual death, but also things like Alzheimer's. Um, there's been some links to diabetes, all sorts of diseases that we're seeing now explode seem to be linked, at least in part, to air pollution. The UN calls it one of the most important health crises ever. And obviously, a large portion of that uh, air pollution, not all of it, is from energy generation from these dirty fuel sources, especially coal. Coal also itself does release some radioactivity by the burning of these products, which are themselves slightly radioactive. It turns out there's a lot of things around us all the time that are radioactive. Bananas being, of course, the popular example because bananas are lightly radioactive. And if you eat enough, you can actually, I mean, like a lot. If you eat a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of bananas, you can uh, give yourself radiation poisoning. I mean, like an obscene amount. I mean, like you're force feeding bananas, like, but it's possible. Um, nuclear plants, when they're operating correctly, really are fairly safe in terms of radiation. Coal plants release much more radiation to the people around them. And, and, and so the misguided fears about like, oh, they're building a nuclear plant around me. Um, I'm going to get like radiation poisoned. You know, if everything is working fine, you're not. You're going to be safe. Um, and, and that is a good misconception to clear up because there are legitimate concerns about nuclear power. But the ones that most people have are incorrect. And, and in my head, I see this very much as like similar to those GMO arguments where people are freaked out about the fact that they're editing DNA or, or whatever. When the larger mm -hmm. concerns that you should have against GMO type crops is the fact that seeds are being uh, turned into intellectual property, right. which can then uh, be forced upon people. Uh, you know, local seed banks have been put out of business mm -hmm. intentionally. And then, of course, a lot of these GMO seeds require a bunch of pesticides just to be possible. So right. you're, you're taking a diverse agricultural space and turning it into a very uh, chemical-dependent monoculture system that also enslaves farmers in massive debt. Exactly. Especially the monoculture one for me. I think that's really what gets me because that causes not only this loss of diversity, but also this massive insect death. And it's part of the reason why we've seen 60 to 75% of insects disappear over the past few decades. Um, so, I mean, people are mad at GMOs and that's valid and the business behind them, but they're <laughs> mad for the wrong reasons. And I think in most cases, when people are scared or hesitant about nuclear power, it's for these wrong reasons. Though there are legitimate concerns, which I will go into once you tell us how many lives we're saving by utilizing nuclear power. <laughs> well, according to this paper published in Environmental Science and Technology in 2013 called Prevented Mortality and Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Historical and Projected Nuclear Power, the authors calculate that between 1971 and 2009, 1 1.8 million deaths were prevented by the use of nuclear power, which was the opportunity cost of increased coal and other fossil fuel uh, burning power sources. Um, they cite the air pollution. They talk about greenhouse gas emissions leading to deaths from climate change. And so their conclusion is that we should not increase natural gas power plants, but we should increase our nuclear power if we want to solve climate change and also save lives. And this, this is a pretty good paper. It's, it's one of two papers we found that actually tried to associate a number of deaths with coal and uh, natural gas and this dirty generation techniques while comparing it to uh, actual deaths of nuclear generation. And um, I, nobody has done a study on affected life years, and I'd love to see that. But there are a couple problems in this paper for me when I read it. One of the things especially is it's, it's linking deaths to potential climate change that's going on. And it makes a false equivalence of 
solely CO2 emissions, um, X parts per million to a number of degrees above pre-industrial levels. And this is something that's easy to make a mistake of because the IPCC does do this in terms of trying to make their story as simple as possible. But if you're trying to really gather up all the data and how much uh, people's lives are affected by these technologies, you can't just look at this this very simple like X number of parts per million equals uh, this much warming, especially when you're talking about dirty generation. And the reason why is because of something we've talked about on the show before, um, but I've just seen some papers that establish more information on it, and that's a process called global dimming. Do you remember this, Daniel? Yeah, that's that all the contrails and you know cloud seeding that a lot of our airplanes and cargo ships are inadvertently creating is actually preventing some of the solar radiation from uh, warming our planet. And that if we were to suddenly ground every airplane in the sky, we would actually experience an immediate warming of our planet. Yeah, exactly. It's this aerosol effect that's from a variety of sources, burning of fuel on airplanes, especially the burning of dirty fuel. Uh, this bunker oil on uh, cargo ships, something that is going to be stopped soon with that European passage of, of banning this fuel and it's going <laughs> to increase temperatures by like a quarter degree centigrade as soon as that happens. And nobody figured that out. Um, but a large portion of this is aerosols and specific chemical emissions from these uh, natural gas and coal plants that basically make the earth have a higher overall albedo. And this is a topic that we keep coming back to. Albedo is how much uh, energy is absorbed versus how much is reflected. And this global dimming is the process of releasing more of these products into the air, ensuring that the amount of sunlight that hits the surface is less than it would be without them. And if we were to snap our fingers today and turn all of our dirty generation plants that are burning coal, that are burning fossil fuels, and replace them with something relatively clean, like nuclear, and if we pretended that there was no CO2 costs associated with the construction of these plants or the uh, mining of the fuel or whatever, uh, we, we're magic. We're, we're doing an imagined example here. Well, uh, typically on the older reports, IPCC would have said that's about 0.6 to 0.7 degrees of warming instantaneously, which you know puts us right at 2C right now, Daniel, or right b- below it. But recent papers that have come out said, oops, we underestimated the effect of global dimming. It's about twice as much as we thought. Uh, the actual number, if we snapped our fingers and did this, we would see the temperatures jump 1.3 to 1.5 degrees centigrade, basically instantaneously. So in this paper's example, where they're equivalating, like we should get rid of all these these dirty fuel generation plants and replace it with nuclear, and we'll be able to keep the temperatures down, and this number of people will, will be alive because of this process. Well, they're wrong, because if we replace everything with nuclear power, uh, suddenly we're going to be above two degrees Celsius instantly. Not saying that we this means we should keep burning coal, uh, but it is something that we need to be conscious of when we're talking about, well, what do we do? What plans do we have? Uh, does this mean we're going to start geoengineering and uh, spraying aerosols? In order to make up for the fact that we're decommissioning these coal plants, or what do we do here? Um, and there's there's really no conversation of this. I mean, I'm getting really nitty gritty on this. I don't know why I'm spending so much time uh, taking down this paper. It's worth reading. Other things it doesn't uh, take into account is how long it takes to build a plant. You know, the process of shifting from coal to natural gas. It just assumes we could do it all instantaneously, and this many lives would be saved because of that. They're interesting reads, but uh, the lives saved aren't as high as uh, these papers would suggest. When you actually start taking into account the feedback loops and the pros and cons and the realistic timelines of this stuff. That brings us, David, to some of the risks associated with nuclear power generation. While we're on the topic of climate change, while the Fukushima meltdown was not a direct result of climate change, and in a way this is actually worse for us because it means we couldn't even predict the fact that a naturally occurring event could cause a meltdown like this, and these naturally occurring events will only become unpredictably worse as climate change progresses. Nevertheless, the fact that this plant was flooded caused a lot of regulatory bodies around the world to start questioning the ability for their own nuclear power plants to withstand uh, similar events. And in particular, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission asked plant owners in the U.S. to evaluate their risk to flooding going uh, forward. And 90% of them said they are at risk for climate change induced flooding that their plants were not designed to withstand. Specifically, 54 U.S. plants are not prepared for the future flood risk that is incoming. 
53 of them are not designed for our present day risk of high rainfall. 25 of them won't be able to handle the floods expected to occur from adjacent rivers and so on. There are more, but you get the idea. But what's interesting to me is that this risk is more than likely underrated since the plant operators themselves were the ones who evaluated not only their own preparedness, but were also allowed to make their own projections about how climate change would impact flooding for their plants. And so in addition to that, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not requiring plant operators to update their evaluations of risk going forward. And the kicker to this is that the NRC even refused to establish any binding requirements based on the risk projections that these plant owners did provide. And when it comes to risk, David, this is a big one for me. When, when we really get down to brass tacks here and we talk about should we implement more nuclear power, should we decommission plants, Should we emphasize renewables over nuclear power generation? Although some people will refer to nuclear power generation as a renewable source of energy. These are the types of things that I have to consider. That our own government, our regulatory body that oversees nuclear power generation in the United States, recognize that there is a risk that, you know, Fukushima is a cautionary tale that we don't always design our energy infrastructure around possible natural disasters. And so what did they do? They said, well, okay, if you own a plant, uh, you make your own internal evaluation of risk. Um, Go ahead and just make your own projections of how climate change might impact you, right? Because power plant operators are the perfect people to evaluate climate change risk. Um, And I'm being sarcastic there, if you couldn't tell. And then based on what they told our regulatory bodies, uh, the response was, okay, well, that's good to know. And we did nothing about it. And we're just basically trusting that these for-profit companies will invest their money wisely to prepare for something that could occur down the line, which will cause a meltdown or cause radioactive material to seep into the environment or whatever it is. And so this doesn't give me a lot of confidence about our commitment to keeping these technologies contained and safe from harming the environment and the public. Those are all really great points, Daniel. I, I, I want to circle back to that uh, in a little bit. Um, especially the idea of of these larger disasters and the failure of the organizations that are responsible for trying to protect us. Um, I've got more to say about it too. <laughs> well, we will, I, and and I guess this is the part of the show where we start sounding really anti nuclear. But I mean, really, the larger nuclear conversation is is that yeah, nuclear has risks, but look how safe it's been so far, which is the one big argument. And the second one is, and we have no choice. This is the only uh, type of power that does generate enough power and does it in a way that is consistent. And and maybe we glossed over this a second ago when we we're talking about the pros of nuclear power. And, and I don't want to underemphasize this point and, and how important it is. Um, but there is no other power generation technology um, outside of hydro, which I'll talk about in a second, that generates consistent base load power, which is which is to say that all power that we need all the time is consistent. We can estimate it. We know it's always going to be there. And, uh, and then on top of that, we'll, we'll you know, add or, or subtract power based on the current needs of the grid. Because remember, uh, as we talked about in our episodes about the grid, you can't just create surplus power. You have to sort of always keep the amount of power going into the grid as the same that's coming out. Um, it needs to be very closely matched and it's difficult to do. And it's really hard to do with technologies that you can't count on. So things like wind, things like solar, where the input is always changing. The wind is always changing. Clouds are coming in front of the sun. You have days, you have nights. Um, when either you're not generating power at all or weather patterns make that generation very different. All of this means that it's very hard to make sure that you have a consistent load on the grid. And sometimes this is why you hear stories where like, oh, people in Germany were being paid not to generate power. Um, And that's because the grid is overloaded. There's too much power going in. So they have to shut stuff off, disconnect it. And you hear like weird things like that happening. The only plants that consistently can create this type of baseload power are nuclear, our coal, our oil, our natural gas, our hydro. And of those, only nuclear and hydro are what we see as clean technologies, saying that they can create this power without releasing carbon dioxide and other noxious gases into the atmosphere. And hydro, for the most part, is fairly maximized at this point. All the places that we can build out hydro without drastically upsetting ecosystems and environments more than we already have are built out. 
there's not a lot of good places left. So we can't really increase hydroelectric power too much. But nuclear power, you can, in theory, build many places. Though, it, as Daniel mentioned, you typically tend to want to build close to a large body of water that allows you to pull in this, this liquid for a cooling loop to either create the steam or to maintain uh, larger cooling for the, the plant itself, especially if it's one of these light water reactors. But that is something that can actually be environmentally harmful. Um, in addition to being threatened by rising sea levels because you're building so much close to these large bodies of water typically, or if you're building alongside rivers, um, as we see changing weather patterns, these flooding patterns get much more uh, dramatic and out of control. So that's at risk, even if you're not on a place that would typically be threatened by higher sea levels. Climate change can still be an issue there. But, but in terms of local environmental damage, hydroelectric energy gets a lot of criticism for uh, a lot of valid criticism for just basically drowning places and, and leaving it up to, well, you know, the plants, animals still figure it out. Fuck them. Um, nuclear power is not clean in this process either. And oil and gas really get most of the attention here. There's some funny propaganda about windmills killing, you know, tons and tons of birds. Which is true. It is true. And it's valid and bats and things. But compared to buildings, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a big difference. Uh, we've been killing birds horribly for a long time. They get trapped in lights. and it, Maybe we'll do an episode on birds, Daniel. I have a lot of bird facts. Domestic cats kill about 2 billion songbirds a year. Well, look at this. If we're talking about numbers here. Um, so we have a plant uh, that powers much of, of New York's power called Indian River. It's uh, upstate on the Hudson. It's, I don't know, it's maybe a 45 minute train ride. You can see it as you're going up, maybe less than that even. It used to be three reactors. They decommissioned one in the 70s. There's two left. Uh, the plant is currently slated for decommissioning next year and then again the following year for the third reactor. And I'll talk about more uh, the decommissioning process in a moment. But when I was doing research into this plant, because it is so close to me, one of the things I found was an environmental paper talking about the types of localized environmental damage this plant does. And Indian River is not a great run plant. And this is one of these things that I think touches on what you're talking about, Daniel, where we trust these officials to be protecting us and keeping us safe. But the economic realities and the actual just day-to-day -day operations of these plants oftentimes are anything but. Indian River has lots of cracks in some of their reactors. Um, their waste pools have cracks in them. They've, they've seeped into the water level, contaminating the area with the radioactive material, um, which is, is bad for obviously the local environmental life and the people who are close by and also concerning because it's, so, it's literally built on the Hudson River. But the water they pull in from the river in order to run through their, their direct cooling plant is, you know, it's piped through the plant, it's heated up, it's turned to steam, then it's condensed back down, it's shipped back into the river and then gone, sent on its way. And, you know, it's, it doesn't pick it up any radioactivity in this process. It's, in fact, it's extremely purified through this, but it comes in the water extremely hot. And additionally, the intake of this process is devastating for local life. This plant alone kills 1 billion fish and fish larvae every single year just through this intake process. And that's not counting any of the other environmental damage that's done from its radiation leaks, from uh, the operations of the plant itself. Just the act of taking in water is killing a billion fish and fish fry annually, mm. which makes that number about windmills look positively ridiculous because this is a single plant. You know, we multiply this number by hundreds of times. There's 450 plants worldwide. There's 50 more under construction right now. That number is going to be doubled but to 450 over the next couple of years of plants that are currently being planned and, and will be put into place. So soon we'll have a thousand plants worldwide. Most of these are built on some source of water, and most of them are causing dramatic environmental effects on that water. But because it's in the water, it's something we don't pay attention to. We don't pay attention to marine life nearly as much as terrestrial life. And so the environmental slaughter that these plants have in the local areas that they're built aren't accounted for. They're not concerned. And it's only organizations like Riverkeeper, where I found this original report, which is someone that we've worked with before on the show, actually, Daniel, do these types of things come to life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the reputation that nuclear plants have for being environmentally friendly outside of the radiation concerns really aren't well earned when you start getting into the nitty gritty of it. Especially, so I mean, I decided to take this line of thought even further and said, well, if we're talking about the unseen side of this stuff, what is the actual CO2 emissions of a plant throughout its lifetime, right? Well, let's see what we'd have to consider, David. Um, when you cause uranium to undergo a nuclear reaction, there is no greenhouse gas emissions. So checkmate. 
Well, that that's what I think the math a lot of uh, nuclear fans do, but... Also, uh, this podcast is accepting donations from the nuclear industry. As well as from uh, Big Oil and also the renewable industry. So please fund us and we will shill for you. But unless, it, were you trying to include more than that, David? Perhaps the manufacturer of nuclear reactors, uh, perhaps the mining of uranium itself, or perhaps the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that go into decommissioning a plant, which can take 20 to 60 years. Yeah, exactly. This is the entire way that you calculate the actual full, what the energy industry calls life cycle emissions. And so this is everything. This is from the process of designing, of building the plant, of all that concrete that goes into building a, a nuclear plant, which is a lot. And concrete is a major CO2 emission source. In fact, one of the largest ones worldwide, um, the process of mining the fuel, the process of fueling it, of maintaining it, of all the oil and, and fuel involved in that process throughout its lifetime up to when you shut the plant down, you start decommissioning it, blah, blah, blah. But they do this math not only for nuclear power plants, but also conventional power plants, um, oil, coal, natural gas, um, different types, different technologies there, solar, windmills, gasification, geothermal, all these different types of technologies of generating energy. There are people who do the math for all this to figure out, well, you know, how much are we actually costing in the full life cycle creation of this process? Are we getting more energy out than we're putting in? Are we saving more emissions than we would if we were using an alternative technology or more traditional technology like just burning coal? And the answer in the end is, you know, yes, actually, um, a nuclear plant does save on CO2 emissions compared to a coal plant, and it does save CO2 emissions compared to a natural gas plant. But it's not as much as you would think. And there are some deferring numbers for this. And there's really only one or two good papers that, that really integrate everything. Um, there's a lot that are put out by the nuclear industry, which tend to leave out major steps of these processes. But what you get in the end is that a nuclear plant is probably generating between 112 and 160 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour generated over the course of its life, which is a 60 year time span for the most part. Which is pretty good because a traditional coal plant is going to be something like 1.2 kilograms in that same time. So this is almost 10 times less CO2 emissions generated than a coal plant. Mm. But we don't really build normal coal plants anymore. Um, we've really transitioned over to natural gas. And we've really transitioned not just to straight burning of natural gas, but things like combined cycle gas turbines and then adding carbon sequestration technology to those on top. So if we take a modern plant compared to a modern nuclear plant, that is a natural gas CCGT CCS style plant. Okay, this is what they're building now. If you're hearing someone build a natural gas plant, the carbon life cycle emissions for that plant is about, over the course of 60 years, 200 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour generated. So basically, that's 50% to maybe 80% more than what a nuclear plant is uh, releasing. So at that point, you're not that much more environmentally friendly, even in terms of the CO2 thing, which is the biggest advantage nuclear power has over these alternative style things. Plus, the power you're generating is significantly more expensive than these alternative styles. Nuclear power is just about the most expensive power you can create. And that's not even accounting the fact that modern plant construction has exploded in cost and is much more expensive than it used to be, even though we have new technologies and things. Yeah, isn't a new plant something like 20 you can get up to like $20, $30 billion. Yeah, well, I'll talk about new plant construction in just a moment, but it's really exploded. But so there's a great report, uh, Lazard Levelized Cost of Energy Analysis. It's the de facto industry standard explanation of how much energy costs for a variety of things. If you're an energy nerd, this is a great report. I'm sure you're already aware of it. We'll link to it on the website. It's really fascinating and it's pretty and easy to read. And they break down different technologies based on the actual cost from low to high and then give you a range of in-between on average. So nuclear for uh, each megawatt hour generated, uh, you're talking probably between $97 and $136 per megawatt hour, with most plants costing $124 per megawatt hour generated. A natural gas plant is going to cost something like $68 to $100 per megawatt hour generated. Gas combined cycle 52 to 78. Uh, IGCC, maybe 96, very similar in price to a nuclear power generation. The only things that are more expensive than nuclear power in terms of creating power are either gas peaking plants, which are small plants for a very specific type of energy generation that nothing else can really replace, or diesel reciprocating engines, which fill the same type of niche that gas peak plants do. So 
not only is nuclear not competitive in terms of dollars, and in fact is one of the least competitive and getting less competitive as time goes on, unlike these other technologies, which are getting more cost competitive, especially renewables, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But you're hardly saving any actual carbon emitted in this process. And it's just because we've hidden the costs of these carbon emissions through the construction and decommissioning and mining of this fuel that we don't see it. I mean, uh, like I said, a modern natural gas plant is only going to emit 50% more carbon, even though it's directly burning this fuel, than a nuclear plant does. And I mean, obviously, we shouldn't be emitting any carbon. (laughs) We'll get to that, I guess, in a moment. But these savings aren't nearly as much as they're made out to be in terms of what uh, the nuclear industry would like you to think. And I I think that's just really important to emphasize. And it really uh, becomes obvious when we start looking at renewable energy, which is on the scale of, you know, 15 to 50 grams per kilowatt hour generated over the life cycle emissions. And the costs have just been plummeting. So utility scale solar installs are something like 58 to $70 for megawatt hour generated, which is less than half the cost of nuclear power. Wind is also getting down to that same range. Um, geothermal is, is, is in the 80s to 90s. All these technologies that are much cleaner, that have much less downsides other than this baseload issue, are much more cost competitive at this point. And what's really interesting, and I, I think is, is the death knell for nuclear, is that solar with battery storage is now basically the same megawatt hour cost as nuclear power itself. And there are different environmental concerns with the construction of those batteries, depending on what type of energy storage they're using. But when that process costs as much as nuclear power, then why are we building nuclear plants? Because you get the base load costs, you have lower carbon emissions, and it costs the same. You don't have the risks of nuclear. I don't understand at that point what the, uh, what the nuclear arguments are anymore, in terms of at least fission as we know it today. And that, that's, of course, disregarding the environmental costs, which we just discussed, you know, a billion fish annually, basically per plant. It's a huge loss of life because of these, these things that we just never talk about. And at this point, I guess I'm really sounding um, anti-nuke more than anything. But uh, all these things need to be said because this is the kind of stuff that you don't hear uh, in these larger conversations because people, you know, they're not going to spend two hours talking about nuclear power. But we should. This is something that is very important to the continued use of energy um, and technologies around the world. And uh, we're building a lot in the next couple decades. And a lot of people want to invest a lot more into this. So we need to be realistic about the concerns as well as the pros. David, um, before we continue with your ramblings and my Oof. semi-ramblings. Oof, you um, cut me off here, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's, uh, let's break this up and we're going to do a part two. And I know we did that last week, although it was over two days. We're going to do this over two weeks. And I promise we're not going to make a habit of making these super long episodes where we just ramble on for three hours or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> well, there's there's a lot to say in terms of nuclear power. And I, I feel like full disclosure is necessary here, Daniel, because uh, we actually did record this episode as <laughs> one nonstop three hour long take. And uh, we got to the end and we're like, we can't do this. We can't do this to our listeners. Uh, we can't do this to ourselves to edit this all in time. So we're going to yes. pretend <laughs> that we always plan to break this up into two parts. But I, I guess I'm giving that away now. But we're tr- we try and be transparent here. So there's some transparency for you. Boom. We are transparent with you. This is part one finished. And next week will be part two. And there's a lot of really good. All the good stuff's in part two. So like, yeah, now you know how nuclear power works. Now you know a little bit about it. But if you want to get to the fun stuff, you're going to need to tune into next week. That's where the fun starts to get ratcheted up. You might even say we go nuclear. That's real bad. All right. Goodbye, everybody. A lot to think about. But until then, you can find all the references we use for this. And there are many, as well as a full transcript of this episode on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible. And we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, visiting us at patreon.com slash ashesashescast. Every little bit helps. Or you can buy some listener-designed stickers at our swag shop, ashesashes.org slash shop. And as always, you can send us an email at contact at ashesashes.org 
And we encourage you to send us your thoughts. We'll read them and we appreciate them. We've also got a nifty phone number you can call and leave us messages. We're going to collect these and put them in a call-in show someday whenever we get around to this. Uh, We encourage you to give us a ring and leave us a message. That number is 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. You can also reach out or follow us on all your favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast. And come join our Discord community. It's a great group of people. You can find a link to that on our website. Just click the community link and then find the Discord invite. Uh, There are tons of us in there. We're there all the time. So come hang out. Next week, we've got part two coming up. So we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Okay, that's that's all I know about nuclear power. (laughs) Daniel's like, I'm I'm done. done. I'm not talking anymore. Well, it sounds good. (laughs) You, you know, there's two types of nuclear force too, right? Strong and weak. Yeah. What's the difference? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you hear me? I said, that's, that's all I know. <laughs>